Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. I want to take you to Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, 163 years ago today. On December 26, 1860, Major Robert Anderson evacuated his garrison from Fort Moultrie to Fort Sumter. The move comes just a week less than a week after South Carolina voted to secede from the Union. It was a smart move militarily. It put Anderson and his men in a better defensive position at Fort Sumter. The Northern press, when they got this news, blasted South Carolina's leadership and U.S. President James Buchanan, the lame duck who was soon to be replaced by Abraham Lincoln. One of the editorials against Buchanan and the administration in South Carolina was written by Jane Gray Swisshelm. She's pictured here. She's the editor of the St. Cloud Democrat. Now, before I read her editorial, let me tell you just a little bit about her. She's a fascinating individual. Her life dates 1815 to 1884. Jane Gray Swisshelm is a fervent abolitionist and a forceful women's rights advocate. She's also one of America's first female journalists. She started out in Pittsburgh as editor and publisher of a publication called the Pittsburgh Saturday Visitor. That was in 1847. Three years later in 1850, she was hired by Horace Greeley at the New York Tribune. In this role, she went to Washington, D.C., and she successfully lobbied the vice president, Millard Fillmore, for a spot in the Senate press gallery, which up until that time did not permit women to be part of it. During the Civil War, she served for a time as a nurse. If you get a chance, I highly recommend her 1881 autobiography, titled Half a Century. I've posted the link here. You can read it for free. Now, without further ado, let me read about what Jane wrote about South Carolina and President Buchanan in the wake of the occupation of Fort Sumter. The title of her editorial, Secession and Treason. Here we go. By our telegraphic reports, it will be seen that South Carolina has passed an ordinance of secession and that James Buchanan, by the wrath of God, president of these disunited states, has ordered the commander at Fort Moultrie to surrender if attacked and to deliver over the U.S. arms on demand of South Carolina. This last is calculated to exasperate northern men to the point of sending an army to retake the property thus treasonably given up. But we trust that even this will not allow to be forcing the free states into a war with their weaker neighbors. As a pecuniary matter, it would not pay. All the U.S. property in the South is not worth the cost in dollars of storming Fort Moultrie. And there can be no glory to be won in such a war. To fight the cotton states would be an old Mexican war cowardice done over again. A strong man striking a cripple. To the South, we would have the North yield everything but principle. To recede from the position assumed that freedom is national, slavery sectional, would stamp the northern states with cowardice. It would so stamp them because the rights of others are at stake, because it is a question of worldwide interest, a principle on which our government was founded because the northern states have just voted in defiance of all the arguments which could be brought to bear on the subject to reinvigorate this principle and to yield to threats. What is denied to reason is the part of the poltroon. But as regards U.S. property, all the world knows that the free states could hold or retake every dollar's worth in the South 
and their forbearance to do so can bring no disgrace and involves no moral wrong. Let the South keep the property in their hands and go in peace. If this report of Buchanan's orders is correct, he has undoubtedly committed overt acts of treason against the government he has sworn to serve, but he is scarcely a free moral agent. The burden of his sins lie at the door of those who elected him, a man in his second childhood, to perform duties which required the best capacity of the best minds in the full vigor of life. Mr. Buchanan must be of 84 years of age, and what could anyone expect of him but imbecility especially when it is known that he has always drank copiously of whiskey? Colonel Benton and John Quincy Adams kept their mental vigor to the last, but they were strictly temperate. When the American people placed a wine bibber and a dotard in the presidential chair, they had no reason to expect of him a different result. They have no right now to curse Mr. Buchanan, for there is not one man in 10,000 at his age who would be fit to fill the place he occupies. Let the great free North be patient and not allow itself to be driven to any act of rashness by the bluster of a set of bullies and the driveling of a man who has long outlived the age of action, of one who should have been sitting with his great-grandchildren on his knee, telling fairy tales of all the years he has been presiding over the destinies over a great nation. Let South Carolina have Fort Moultrie and the United States arms. She needs them all, and we do not. She may think she has a moral right to the property and her borders. And what do we want with forts and arsenals there? We certainly do not want to hold her as a subjugated province, even if she were worth a tenth of the cost, which she is not. Let us give a hearty goodbye to our peppery neighbors and treat Mr. Buchanan with the leniency his age demands. So there you have Jane Gray Swisshelm, editor of the St. Cloud Democrat in Minnesota, letting out her feelings about President James Buchanan, the aged dotard in the White House, lashing out at South Carolina and those who have seceded to let them go ahead and keep the arsenals and keep the U.S. property and good riddance to them. So thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.